say if you hear any little noise. Mm -hmm. You're, you're, you're going to say what you do. Hello everyone and welcome back to my kitchen. Thank you so much for joining us for this cook along. I think you're going to like it because um, this is one of my go-to dishes, like company dishes when I don't have very much time at all and it's really something that anybody could do. Now before I say anything else, you may be hearing a little one um, off in the corner there. And that's my granddaughter. Her mom is working and her dad is stuck at the dentist, which is not a place you really want to be stuck. Um, but so she's joining us for this cook along and she may just make herself be known at a couple of places. Right now, I think she's watching Encanto, if you want to know the truth. So she loves Encanto. Okay, so let's start with uh, going over all the ingredients for both that arroz a la tumbada, one of the specialties of the state of Veracruz, and for the cake, the pumpkin seed Mexican chocolate cake that we're going to be making. So let's do first all of the things that we need for the, the cake. So why don't we come around this way and we will we'll go over all of those things. So we need the toasted salted pumpkin seeds. Now these are not raw pumpkin seeds. These are the toasted salted ones like you would buy in the snack aisle. And it's a divided use thing. So we have a half a cup and a cup and a quarter there. We have sugar and it's a divided use also. We've got a cup here and then we've got a couple tablespoons there. We'll need a third of a cup of flour, a little bit of baking powder and Mexican chocolate to put in here. Now, is, this is a butter cake, so we have some butter. Um, you need that butter out now. If, you, if it's not out, it, it's going to be a little hard to incorporate it into the cake, though you could do it, but I've had mine out for 45 minutes now, three eggs. And if you want, a splash of tequila can go in here. It wouldn't be bad with a little bit of vanilla. Um, so now we're going to, oh, and of course you need your cake pan, and you do need a piece of parchment to go in the bottom of it. Um, if parchment is not available and you have anything like wax paper, that will work too. Um, but we do need something to release this cake away from the pan when we flip it over. Okay, we need an oven on 350 degrees. Um, another place that you could roast things under a broiler, that could be just a toaster oven if you want. I have two ovens. I'm very lucky here. I understand that. So I have one of them on the, um, on the broiler. Now, I've got my seafood for all of this um, in the refrigerator. But I'm going to bring that out so that we can look at that right now. I have it over some ice because I've, I wanted to make sure that it stayed really in good shape here. So we have some halibut, shrimp. Now you'll notice that the shrimp are peeled and deveined. I'm leaving the last uh, joint on there, which is the tail joint. And then we have some mussels there, a dozen mussels. Now for flavorings for this dish, I'm just going to move that and I'm going to let that set. I put a piece of plastic wrap over some ice from the refrigerator, I mean from the freezer here. Um, and I just uh, put this on top. You don't want to put the ice directly on fish like this or on shrimp that's peeled because it can burn it. But with even that little plastic wrap between, it will keep them in really good shape. <clears throat> so I say that this is such an easy dish because these are things that I pretty much always have on hand. Um, so I've got a can of tomatoes, that's going to be our basic flavoring here, um, a white onion, a couple of jalapenos, uh, three cloves of garlic, um, a, a quart of chicken broth, which is going to form the base. You won't notice that, this chi that it's got chicken broth in it, but it gives it a beautiful mouthfeel. We have one cup of rice. I'm working with medium grain rice. I think it works the very best here. 
Um, but if you have long grain rice, it'll still work. You'll still like it. And I have, I do have some beautiful epazote here. If you have it, you'll be using that too. And then I've got um, some cilantro. That's what I've chosen. You can do this dish with parsley as well. So I'm going to just keep these things over the, the side. And then of course we've got um, some limes that I cut up, but that'll be a garnish that comes much, much later. Okay, so what we're going to start with here is roasting some vegetables. Um, I've got my three cloves of garlic. Those are just going to stay there. In the recipe, I didn't say to do this, but I'm going to suggest that we do this today, which is to cut the jalapenos in half so that they roast just a little bit faster here. Um, and... I'm going to put a few slices of this onion. Now in the recipe, I called for a, a small white onion. For me, that's four ounces. This is fully eight ounces, okay? So I'm gonna cut the base of this off here. And then I actually need to peel off this exterior. Now, a lot of times when you see me cooking on my YouTube channel or on television, I've done all this already because I don't usually want people to have to watch me doing this kind of thing. But when I do cook-alongs, I want to make together in all of this um, and that I don't just fly fast in ahead of you. So I'm going to make some slices. Now, look at the thickness of this slice, okay? It's a little over a quarter of an inch. And that's going to be good for this roasting thing here. So I'm going to just lay down about four slices of this onion. Well, that one doesn't want to come off the knife there. Um, put that one directly over there instead of letting it fall down there. And then one more. And that's about half of my onion there. Okay, so then we'll get all of this lined up here. Now you'll notice here that I have a sill pad on here, one of those silicone baking uh, mats on there. That's just for easy cleanup because I can throw that thing in the dishwasher. Um, some people like to put foil down. I'm more of a reuse kind of a person and if you put foil down, that's pretty much a single use kind of thing. So let's slide that into the oven. Now, now I have this, the, my my rack there as high as it will go. So it's about four inches away from the element. And I'm going to set my timer here for five minutes, which I know will pretty much be the right amount of time for this uh, roasting on one side. Then we'll flip it over and roast the other side for a short period of time as well. Okay, so we're going to get that um, and clean up the mess because we're going to move right into making this cake next. So I'm going to take all of my ingredients that I had sitting out here for you and push them away from me so that we can have room to make this cake um, nicely here. Um, we're going to come back to using the blender in just a bit. So I had just set out the jar, but then we'll come back to that. Okay, so for the cake, um, I have asked you to have your piece of parchment paper already um, cut to fit in there. Now, what I like to do, again, I set out my, my butter about 45 minutes ago, is just put a few swipes of the butter um, in the pan and go around just giving it a... I'm not being very careful here, but it, that's going to help me anchor this parchment paper because where I want to put most of my butter is on top of that parchment paper. I'm going to go around the outsides of this pan. Um, for many cakes, the edges don't matter that much. I know that a lot of people say, oh, be careful about uh, buttering the entire sides of the pan and everything. But for most cakes, it doesn't really. In some cakes, you don't want to butter at all because you want the cake to adhere to the sides so that it can go up and then hold up there. That would be the sort of foam cakes, a lot of things like chiffon cakes and, and angel foods. Okay, so now look at this. So I, I spread that butter in there, but it's a really heavy amount of the butter that I put in there. But I put it in evenly all the way across. That's going to help us to make a crust that is going to be pumpkin seeds and sugar. Um, and then I got to get my hands clean from all that butter there. And then go over here and I'm going to grab the pumpkin seeds and the sugar. This is the half cup of the pumpkin seeds. And usually when I'm doing bacon, baking, 
I'll do all my mise en place, that's what we call that, but I'll do all my mise en place before I start. That way I can get right into the, the, the preparation of the batter without running here and there trying to grab stuff. Now I want to make a fairly even layer of these pumpkin seeds. It's not going to be a heavy, heavy layer, but it's going to be enough to lightly coat the pan. Now I developed this recipe um, of several years ago because I really I wanted to do something that really focused the flavor of pumpkin seeds so pumpkin seeds are native to Mexico and I thought wow we could do something that has this really moist texture um, and it, it really has the earthy nuttiness of pumpkin seeds we've got something really great on our hands um, so I worked on this recipe for quite a while and then I I, I really landed on this one and I really like it a lot. The thing is that if you're not much of a baker, you can easily execute this recipe um, and you don't have to do like lots of fancy stuff because it's just that good. <laughs> so it's the flavor that will make people ooh and ah and it doesn't have to be a beautiful um, contraption of a cake. Okay, so then evenly sprinkle the, the sugar over those pumpkin seeds. So you see when you get it over here, two tablespoons actually looks like quite a lot in there. And now we'll make the, the batter itself. So we're gonna start with the second amount of the pumpkin seeds. So this is our cup and a quarter plus a cup full of, of uh, sugar, the second part. Now, if you'll notice, if you notice that my sugar is not completely white, it's because I really believe in organic sugar. And it's, um, I, I'm a huge believer in organics in general, but I will say the th reason that I say organic sugar here is because it has way more flavor than white sugar does. White sugar is pretty much devoid of flavor. And this has a richness to it that if you make a simple syrup out of white sugar and one out of the organic sugar that's kind of tan, there's no comparison. You would always be gravitating to the organic one. Okay, so now I'm going to pulse. And I like to do about one second pulses. And when this stuff looks like damp sand, then I'm where I need to be. Um, and you may wonder, why do you pulse? Why don't you just let it run? It's because when you pulse, it all falls back down again and it gives you a more even thing. You won't end up with big pieces that are not ground up. Okay, so now let's look at that and see what, what sort of damp sand looks like, okay? Damp because there's a little oil in those pumpkin seeds. And they have some salt in there too, so you'll notice that we don't have any salt in this recipe. Okay, to that now, I'm going to add the, the eggs and the butter. This is where I say that if you or your butter is firm, then you're probably going to want to cut it up into small pieces. Um, I do all baking, and I'm, I'm a real... I'm a, I'm a real advocate of baking. I love baking, uh, but I do it all by weight because volume measurements in baking are very, very imprecise. Um, so I just made four slices out of that butter in there, but if you've got cold butter, you're probably going to want to, um, to cut it up into smaller pieces just so that this next step can actually happen um, pretty easily without letting it run for too long. You'll kind of get that going. So we got our, our three eggs now and our um, four ounces of butter in there. And then I'm gonna go back to the pulsing to start just to get things moving in there because the next step is to have this look like batter, okay? And if your butter is soft enough, that won't take too long, okay? So let's see what we look like now. I see a little piece of butter there, so I could go another couple of pulses, but it's starting to look like batter. So I'm gonna do that. Then I'm gonna take the top off again. And we have now 
Um, the last two ingredients before we talk about chocolate here, it's one third cup of flour. So you see it's not very much flour here in this, in this and a quarter teaspoon, just a small amount of baking powder to just give it a nice little tiny lift. So I am gonna put, I knocked too much of it out. Okay, and there's our quarter of a teaspoon of that. I'm gonna give it the splash, about a tablespoon or so of um, tequila. As I said before, you could put a splash of vanilla in there if you wanted to, or truthfully, this would be really good with another dark, um, a dark alcohol, something like bourbon would be really good in this one as well. We'll put that back over there. And now we'll just pulse this to get those in, incorporated in. So that should be enough. And now let's talk about Mexican chocolate. So probably the two most well-known Mexican chocolates are Ibarra and Abuelita. Abuelita seems to have just captured everybody's heart because the picture of the grandmother on, on it. And you remember being a little kid and your grandma making this milk with the Abuelita chocolate in there. So if you are sort of a very rational person and you come at Abuelita and Ibarra from the perspective of wanting really good chocolate, Let's just face it, you're not going to find good chocolate in the Abuelita and in the Ibarra. Most people say that it's someplace between 15 and 20 percent chocolate. Okay, so those of you that know about chocolate know that we talk about it in percentages. And pretty much anything under 50 percent is considered to be very light in the chocolate. Okay, so when you're in 15 to 20, we're talking very light. It's got more of that cinnamon flavor in it, um, in a lot of sugar, okay? So there is one company, there's a bunch of companies do, doing really good Mexican chocolate that's at that 50% uh, cacao uh, level, but I will say that a lot of them aren't available in the U.S., or if they are available in the U.S., um, I think I don't, I'm missing my time here. I think I put the wrong time in here. Yes, I certainly did, but it, that was five minutes. So hold that thought, and I'm going to go look at these guys over here and see what we look like. Ah, this is just what I wanted it to look like, okay? So let's see here. So when I say that we're looking for a little char, I mean we're looking for a little char. This one piece over here, I'm going to close that oven up. Uh, this one piece over here is a little dark, but it's not on the other side. I think we're in a good place here. Um, these are charred on the one side. Actually, everything is ready. I don't know what yours look like, but if they're not charred like that, then just flip them over and, um, and put them back in for a minute or two. And I'm just going to leave these the way they are and come back to them in a little bit. Um, I'll put them right back there, but that five minutes was plenty under the broiler because I had set my, somehow it got set for 55 minutes, which five, and I looked at it and um, thought, oh, okay, well, we're exactly where we need to be, so I'll cancel that one. We don't have to put that one back in anymore. Um, let's go back to talking a little bit about chocolate here. So as I said, there are many brands in Mexico that you will get that about 50% chocolate. Um, mail order places sometimes have those, but the one most widely distributed um, is made in Mexican style, but not with Mexican beans. And that is the Tasa chocolate. But I find that in so many places around Chicago, and I'm very happy for that. So I bought four different ones to talk about with you here. So these, we have this one that is vanilla flavored and dark. We have, this is just pure cacao and dark, all the way to 70% cacao. This one is the salted almond one. And in Mexico, a lot of times you will find ones that um, are made with almonds, but not necessarily salted almonds. But this is a good one, and this is dark. And then this one is dark with cinnamon, probably the most common way to think about making Mexican chocolate. So we've got this Tasa chocolate with cinnamon is going to be my choice, but I wanted to show you the ones that I found in the grocery store today. 
And they usually a, a Mexican chocolate will be made in a three ounce disc and you need one of them for this, this preparation. However, tossed chocolate for some odd reason is made in two one and a half ounce discs, really about like that. So what we're gonna do here is to cut up the chocolate. Now, the difference between Mexican chocolate and other kinds of chocolate has to do with the refining process. The refining process does not allow or does not have that conching step. That conching step is what makes the chocolate just melt on your tongue. This is considered drinking chocolate and it's very lightly refined, meaning like if you go to Oaxaca and you go to the street where all the cacao, the chocolate mills are, they will put all of the chocolate, the cacao beans through a mill that it looks just like the mill that you would use for making the masa for tortillas, the corn masa for tortillas. They put it through once scrape it in with the sugar and cinnamon and almonds if you want to put that and run it back through a second time that's it so it's not very finely ground and the sugar itself will have a crystalline texture in this so that is the thing that really separates it out you'll notice none of that when you're dissolving this in water or milk, as they do in Mexico. Um, I'm going the wrong direction here. I'm gonna put this into our batter, just right here on the top. Um, so I'm making it about the size of peas, shall we say. And of course you'll need a big knife to do this with. It's way easier to do it with a bigger knife. And one thing that you will notice about the tasa, because it's two small discs rather than one big one like the abuelita, um, that this is easier to cut. So I'm just cutting it in small pieces and then we'll put it right in with the rest of the, the stuff. Okay. So if people can't find this in their grocery store, they should look Online is probably the best place to find this if your grocery store doesn't carry it. Like I said, around Chicago, um, lots of different grocery stores carry Ibarra chocolate. It's getting to be really very commonly found here. Um, so uh, we're just going to pulse that and get that into the oven. And we'll set our timer at the end of that. Pulse it. I'm just going to do, I didn't put the click it in. One. Two, I'm not trying to grind it up into this batter, but just mix it in. Three, and I'm gonna let that be everything. So we have our prepared pan here, and I'm gonna scrape this batter into the pan. You can see how, how easy this whole thing is. So this might be what I would call like one of your back pocket recipes for when company's coming over and you don't have very much time to cook. If you can get the fish on your way home, you can have the whole meal, a beautiful meal fit for company on the table in an hour or so. So we'll scrape that in there. Um, I, I like cakes that are made in a food processor. Um, person had trouble finding pumpkin seeds. Do you have any hints for that? Uh, pumpkin seeds go in and out of fashion. So um, all I can say again is if you have problems with that, please just buy them from online because like um, Amazon carries really nice variety of them. And so then you could just have that um, as your backup. But um, sometimes people will say, if you have party stores around that, that have a lot of snacks in them, oftentimes pumpkin seeds will be there. Um, but really, um, they kind of go in and out of fashion. I, I've been at this for 40 years, teaching people how to make Mexican food. And I can say, sometimes only you could find raw ones, only you could find toasted ones. And so I don't ever know what to write, or write for, but thankfully, because we can now buy things online, it's really easier for us to be able to get all this stuff um, because it can be delivered to you. Okay, there we are. Cake's ready to go. I'm putting it into 350 degree oven. I am gonna ask 
one of the multitude of people that you don't see here to set a timer for 35 minutes. And we will look at that at 35 minutes. Now it's our time to go back to making our rice dish. We have the basis of our flavors here. Um, you know that I like to use fire roasted tomatoes in a can. And so um, I am going to start with that because I think they're more reliable than roasting fresh tomatoes that you buy in the grocery. Oftentimes they're not very good. But of course, if you do have uh, fresh, uh, good fresh ones, and we will in many parts of the United States be getting good fresh ones here in a month or so, um, or you may live in a place that already has good fresh ones in your farmer's market, um, I would suggest that you roast them, roast about a pound of them, and it will turn out with a, about the same amount that's right here. Okay, so I'm going to put those into the, into the blender jar, and then we've got our other roasted flavorings here, and um, I'm going to drop them. You know what, I, it's, I always recommend this to everybody, that if you can just give them a rough chop before they go in, they'll blend better. So I'm going to put those in there. Same thing with my pieces of, of onion here, that I'll just cut those like into quarters so that I can put that in there. And then we've got our garlic here that was roasted in its skin. I'm sorry I never said that. Um, but yes, this was roasted in the skin. But now that it's cooled for a few minutes, the flesh is actually sort of um, separating from the skin. And I can just peel that right off. Okay, that. And then the next one, you see how that comes out? It'll have little dark spots on there. Do not be afraid of those. They're going to add depth of flavor. Um, that little bit of char that's there actually does create depth of flavor. Okay, so this is what I want to show you, and this is what you should be expecting, is that the, the garlic is soft enough that you can twist it back and forth like that. If I need, wanted to, I could tear it open and it would be look completely cooked all the way through. This is the way that we get sweet garlic flavor rather than harsh garlic flavor. Okay, so we're ready to now form our basic I'm having trouble, see, you get to see behind the scenes things. I'm having trouble with that one catching now. Um, but I'm gonna start my pan. You need about a four quart um, uh, vessel to be cooking this in. I'm doing it in enameled cast iron, like Crusade. This isn't a Crusade piece, but this is a piece that I've had for years and years and years. And it's a really nice size for making something like this, especially if you wanna carry this to the table. <laughs> and so it just looks really pretty as a serving dish as well. So now I'm gonna take this over to the, the blender base here and blend it. It won't take very long at all. I'm not trying to get this really, really smooth. I want a little bit of texture still left in it, and that's why when we chopped up the jalapenos and the onions uh, a little bit beforehand, it'll, it'll make that happen without having to leave this on so long just to get the big chunks um, out of there um, that you've, you've had created just a complete paste out of it. Um, so this will have a little bit of flavor, I mean a little bit of texture left in it. Okay, so what I'm looking for here is this pan to be hot enough so that when I film the bottom of this with oil, and this is for this kind of a dish, you want a little bit more than just a tablespoon and a half. I suggest in this recipe about three tablespoons to go in the bottom of this so that that flavor actually becomes part of this dish. So it will be flavored with the olive oil. So I do want enough to cover the bottom, but sort of heavily. Um, another chef here in Chicago gave me this bottle and I have just been enjoying it so much. His wife is Greek 
And um, on her family's property in Greece, they started um, bottling their olive oil. So he brought a bunch of cases of it and put his own label on it and stuff. So I have been enjoying that, that olive oil a lot. Um, usually I'm working with Mexican olive oil here, the stuff that's the Baja Precious that I've talked about a lot. Uh, but today I'm doing the Greek olive oil. Now, the way that we want to test this to see if it's if it's if it's hot enough is to just drop a little bit so you hear a little sizzle right it wasn't quite enough of a sizzle for me so i'm going to get ready to push this all in at one time and just shake it around in there and now in it all goes that extra what 15 seconds that i let it heat there was really the right thing and you should see a little bit of oil. Come on in and, and see. There should be a little oil separating on the top of it. That's how much how you would know that you had the right amount. But I've never lost the boil on this. It's still boiling away in there. That's what I'm looking for. And now I'm just going to stir it as it cooks down. This is the, the alchemy of Mexican cooking is at this point you are actually fusing all of those flavors together and this will take uh, several minutes i always suggest that people think it's going to take about five minutes but that really has to do with your own stove how big of a burner do you have and how hot did you get your pan before you added all of the seasoning the flavoring ingredients into the pan so um, what, we, what we're looking for here is that the flavors of all four of the ingredients that were in there fuse together, and that's you're going to get by this quick reduction, but at the same time, you're going to cook it long enough that the sweetness of the tomato comes out. So you're actually kind of making your own little tomato paste here. So when it looks more like tomato paste than it does right now, you're ready to go. Now, of course, this is something that um, you are a recipe that you do want to think about when um, the tomatoes start in your farmer's market. We're ways away from that here. We have a few farmers that are doing hothouse grown tomatoes, um, but they're not probably the right thing for this yet. Um, I have bought a few of them and loved them, and the cherry tomatoes tend to be a lot better in, in a, uh, right now, those hothouse ones, than the... Um, than the bigger ones that are grown in the hothouse. That's been my experience. Maybe you have uh, had other experiences. Um, so I will, but this is a dish with the jalapenos and the fresh herbs and all that that you want to think about when you see those farmer's market tomatoes um, come in. Okay, so we're getting close to here, but it should look shiny, meaning that you've reduced it so much that you are starting to see the oil separating at the top. Now, a lot of times when people see something that says stir constantly for five minutes, they think, oh my goodness, that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> but it's, it's really not. I mean, it's, uh, what you're doing here is creating flavor that you will enjoy for a long time. So um, I say put the, the work in to create that flavor. And this really is one of the hallmarks of the Mexican kitchen is this reduction of sauce bases um, and the fusing of these flavors together. Okay, so this is probably about a minute or two away. I'm going to set that to the side and I'm going to go over here and talk to you about epazote while that's doing its last little thing. So epazote, um, probably lots and lots of you have seen it. It's a uh, jagged edged herb. It is, um, or sometimes they'll call it sawtooth uh, herb. And it is used extensively in central and southern Mexico, extensively. It's not one of those things that you occasionally see someplace or that you have to look for. No, this is an herb that really does flavor a lot of the food. And once you, the first time you taste it, you may think, oh my God, what is that? Because when you smell it, sometimes you think kerosene, you think some unflattering words. So um, I'm just telling you it does catch on. <laughs> and if you keep using it in things, when you make a pot of beans, if, especially black beans, which are almost always in central and southern Mexico made with epazote, 
Um, this is a, a great place to start with it. But seafood and episote are like a match made in heaven. But you have to understand episote. Okay, so now I've got this where I want it. I hope yours is getting to where you want it as well. But come in and see what it looks like here. You see how shiny it became on the top because the oil has separated out of it some. And it is as thick um, as tomato. If I let this cool off, it would be as thick as tomato paste. So we have reduced this now to that kind of consistency. You can easily see the bottom of the pot when you stir through it which we couldn't do at the very beginning. My next ingredient that's gonna go in here is the cup of rice. Now, this is going to cook a little bit in the oil. If you've ever made Mexican rice before, um, you know that it always starts off by cooking in oil first. So we're gonna stir this for a minute or so in here. And after that has cooked for a minute and we start to see a change in the color of the, uh, of the rice, I'll get rid of these guys over here, um, and the rice will start turning a little bit opaque looking. Of course, you can't see it very well in here, like you can if it was just cooking in oil by itself, but I see a few of these grains now are starting to turn that opaque color, that opaque white look. If there's anything sticking in the bottom of your, your pan, make sure to scrape that up. Oh, this is looking so good, and I hope yours is smelling as good as ours is smelling here. Um, and we will stir that for a minute longer. You can get your broth ready. As I said, I always do these kinds of dishes with a base of chicken broth because I am looking for something um, that is going to give it body. And if we just cook it in water, it won't have the right body. This will fill in the gaps. I'm just using a knife to kind of cut an air hole in there. It just makes this next step go easier. So, so where would they look for epazote to buy? Every Mexican grocery store will have epazote. Um, well, I don't say every. I, I will say everyone in Chicago certainly would. Um, but we have a whole lot of people in, in Chicago that are from Central and Southern Mexico. So they always want their episote. And we get it. We can have it here all winter long. You will find episote in the markets. But there's a huge demand for it in Chicago. And that is, um, that is something that that we can find but so Mexican grocery store is the first place to look I'm going to take you outside in a minute and uh, we can talk a little bit about episote out there I'm going to throw a couple of beautiful sprigs of episote in there we'll hold this cilantro for later um, now I'm going to talk about the the halibut and the mussels and when this comes to a boil I will put the um, halibut and the mussels in this pot Okay, um, so this beautiful piece of halibut, you can use any kind of white ocean fish for this. Um, some people might want to think about doing this with something that is like, um, like tilapia. It will really fall apart in this. You kind of need to go to ocean fish for this, but any kind of snapper, grouper, um, halibut, uh, sea bass, striped bass, any of those things will work really well in a dish like this. But I'm cutting about half inch cubes of this. And then I will just, let's look at what's going on here. Um, if you're sort of up with me here, you should, it should take a several minutes for this to come to a boil. You should have a pretty hot pan because of all that cooking that you've done. So that will help it to come to a simmer faster. Um, but you want to make sure that all the rice is broken up. I noticed when I put the, the broth in here that immediately it was big clumps of this tomatoey rice and then the broth. And so I had to kind of go back and forth gently to break up those clumps. And now I think I have gotten that. And then when we get to a boil here, 
I'll be ready to put those two things in. We're going to leave the shrimp for the very end so that the shrimp is really beautifully, beautifully cooked. Um, but all the rest of this can take a little bit more cooking because we're going to have about 15 minutes of cooking with this rice, okay? And while we're doing, while the rice is cooking and the cake is baking, we're going to go outside and I'm going to show, give you a little garden tour here of some of the unusual things that we grow here in, in our garden. So you'll have a chance to do that, but I hope you're all up to well it'll give you a chance to catch up too if you if you've fallen behind in any of these preparations i will tell you that the only way that cooking goes really smoothly is all about mise en place it's all about making sure that you have all of your stuff gathered and i know a lot of people at home don't do that um, but as a professional cook and of course in in a in a professional kitchen you always have to have your mise en place there because you can't be running the ingredients are not as close as they are in your your kitchen so in our restaurant we keep a whole lot of the stuff we have a a, a whole finished basement where it's we've got walk-in refrigerators and cold storage meaning 55 degree storage of things so you you have to gather everything first and then you start your cooking i am now at a um at, at a boil here so I will, I used a flexible cutting board. I love flexible cutting boards um, because they're super easy to clean. Uh, and since I work directly on my, my wooden uh, cook uh, cutting board there, um, I always, when I'm gonna do fish or anything like that, I always do it on a cutting board like that. Um, and then I can just throw it in the dishwasher. I'm gonna take all of these little mussels here and you will notice that anytime I write a recipe that, start, that has chicken stock as a base, I either call for mussels or clams uh, because when they open up, they will give their flavor to this whole broth. It'll be really, really delicious. I'm going to put the top on this now. Can you give some tips on how you know mussels are fresh when you buy them? Yeah. Mussel. Mussel. Okay. Here you go. I didn't mean to have it all of them in there then. Okay, let me just set that one over there because it was kind of hot. Okay, I'm gonna, let's get this. I'm gonna put the top on it and now I'm gonna turn it way down so that it's medium low-ish here. And we will just let this cook very gently. That's what you, that's the way you cook rice. And so we're cooking, we're cooking it in seafood very gently with it. Now let's go and talk about yeah, okay, I just want to see a little tiny bit of, um, of a bubble, okay? Just a, a gentle bubble. How do you know when a uh, mussel is fresh? It's completely closed like that. Now, if it's open a little bit, like say quarter of an inch, okay? That doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means you have to make sure that the thing is still alive. So we tap them like this on the counter, and if they close right back up, that means they're still in decent shape, so you can use them. And sometimes, like if I'm gonna buy, if I'm gonna do mussels at home, I want ones that just have been, that, that I buy that day. I don't wanna try to keep them in my refrigerator, but if I do have to keep them in my refrigerator, I will put them into, I will put a, a, some ice in the bottom of a bowl, I'll put, Plastic wrap like here, probably a double layer of it, and then I'll put the mussels on top of it. You do not want to submerge them in water because our chlorinated water here will actually kill them. Okay, so I'm going to just put this guy back in here. I see little bubbles going on there. That should all be fine. Um, let's, let me just say one thing about arroz a la tumbada, and I'm going to set my timer now for not one hour, and five minutes. Okay, I'm going to set it for my 15 now. Um, and then we will go outside. But I'll say one thing about arroz a la tumbada. So arroz a la tumbada is one of those dishes that in, in Veracruz, especially in the port of Veracruz, you can find everywhere. It's super easy to make. It's got this really lovely uh, tomato green chili base to it. And then you can put whatever seafood you can lay your hands on in the pot with that as the broth. And then you can cook, take already cooked rice and add it to it. 
Well, that already cooked rice is a problem for a lot of people because then you've got another whole preparation you have to make. And so what I wanted to do was to create this as just a one dish kind of thing so that you could cook your rice right in with everything. And anyway, it'll probably be better. I always call this like a really brothy paella because seafood and rice, for a lot of people, they go straight to the idea of paella. Uh, but this is a brothy one. It's served in a soup bowl. Um, but I will tell you that it's just such a, it's such a joy to be able to present something this, to, like this to company because it's got a variety of seafood in it. It's very hearty and it's very soul satisfying. So let's go outside for a minute and I'll show you. Um, I have my my clock here so with me so that I can see when we need to come back in here and watch there um, so I know a whole lot of you have seen um, my the where I do a lot of the film for um, the shows and stuff and that would be like outdoor kitchen things but a lot of times you don't see this side of the garden this is our production garden where we grow a whole lot of things that we use in the restaurant now, this is a very small production garden, so we really focus on a lot of things that you can produce quickly that are high value things. And usually when you're thinking those things, it's gonna be small lettuces and, and specialty herbs and edible flowers and things along that, those lines, okay? So that's what we're, we're really focusing on over here. So let's, oh, well, let's, let's make a really quick first stop here. Um, so this stuff here, and I'll, I'll ask you to come down here, is um, in Mexico typically called culantro. Um, or in, in, it, it actually went to Southeast Asia, and uh, I think it's called rum rum in Vietnamese, or sawtooth cilantro. Well, this is the original cilantro from Mexico, because what we know now, and, and we expect to find in all of our salsas in Mexico, was actually brought from Southeast Asia, and it, so it is not native to Mexico. But this was where they got that sort of cilantro-like flavor. And when you taste this stuff, um, this is just, uh, we have about six plants that are just getting started in there. But when you taste it, it, it doesn't have the full brightness of cilantro. And it's a kind of tough leaf. And so it's always cooked. This one is always cooked. Um, so you'll go into some communities, especially in the southeast part of Mexico, and they'll be putting this into broths. And they love the way that it tastes when it's cooked. So we don't usually cook cilantro, um, the, the normal cilantro, but this sawtooth cilantro does really well cooked. So I just thought I'd show you that because that is Mexico's original stuff. Okay, so over here, um, we, have a, we have a whole lot of Thai basil and regular Genovese basil. Um, that may seem odd, but um, our bars like to use it in different things. So that's just sort of getting started now. Um, we have a whole lot of flat leaf parsley. This is the kind of parsley that you could use in the arroz a la tumbada that we're making. Here's a good thing to show you because a lot of you probably haven't seen this, but this beautiful plant here is Mexican oregano. And you can see by the way it's growing here, it looks very much like something in the verbena family. And that is exactly what it is, lantana verbena. It's all in this same family of plants. Now this, this herb, you might think because you love basil and basil, dried basil is not very good. This one is actually, like other oreganos, better when it's dried. It has more flavor, more concentrated flavor, and is really very, um, very delicious. But I have it here, not, we use massive amounts of, me of Mexican oregano in the restaurants, but this one I have here just as a show and tell piece. And I like to play around with it in my kitchen here, but it's not something we would use in the, the restaurant. Now, um, for those of you that live in um, cool climate, like I do, this is, um, this is the British sorrel. Um, the, uh, and it has got that really wonderful lemony flavor. Now, the reason I have it in a pot is because I bring this in for the winter because it's one of the things that I can grow in our greenhouse. 
Um, there are places where you can get this to winter over outside, but in Chicago, it's, it's really iffy. So I like to have this in my, it does really well in my greenhouse. And then I can go pick a few leaves and I can make a salt verde with the lemony flavor of sorrel. And that's really delicious. If you haven't explored that, it's super easy to grow. So I suggest that you grow it. Um, we've got um, uh, this plant over here. I'm, I'm like really... I'm a plant nerd that I, I'm really nostalgic about plants. So when my daughter was three, I bought this sage plant for her and it grew just massive. It is sort of on its last leg, but it's also like 27 years old. OK, so um, it is one of those plants that I don't I really try to to keep going here. But um, I, this is something that I, we don't use very much at work, but we um, I like to cook with it at home. You look at this crazy thing back here. Okay, so all of this back here is a huge long row of it. Um, and that is all garlic chives. And 26 years ago when we moved into this house, we inherited this. I don't know why anyone would have planted so much garlic chives, but we've learned about really wonderful things to do with it in our restaurant. Now, you find it a lot in Southeast Asian cooking, and they will cook it. And so that's what we do with it. We actually like to, to oil it and put it on a low grill and get it smoky. It's really delicious. Um, this crazy stuff back here that looks like a grass is called pipicha. And that one is, um, it's sort of like cilantro flavor on steroids. Um, it's pretty hard to germinate. It takes a long time to germinate, but once it gets going, it's very easy to grow. It doesn't do well in the greenhouse. We start it fresh every single year. Um, I've got, oh, this is a beautiful place to be over here. For me, it's a beautiful place to be because here I'm surrounded by some of my favorite herbs and they may be surprising to you. But right here we have a lemon verbena, um, which um, I do, this plant's about four years old. I do bring it in. It's not super happy in the greenhouse, but I can keep it going that way. It looks like it needs a haircut here. Um, but um, I just love the intense lemony flavor in that. Um, and it does grow, uh, it does dry really beautifully and you can make teas out of it or you can use it in ice cream flavorings. That's one of my favorite things to do with it. Um, I never do well with fig trees, but I'm trying again, okay? So <laughs> that's the, the fig tree. Th this is two-year-old now, so we'll see what happens with that. I've not ever been very successful, and I know people around Chicago are successful with it. It's just not me. Um, this gorgeous stuff up here, this is lemon balm. Um, and Torongil in Spanish, and it's more used as just a medicinal tea. But it has a really wonderful lemony flavor, but it goes away real fast. The lemon verbena, the lemon flavor stays. But if you make a tea out of this, it won't have a strong lemon flavor. But I like to put it in, um, in salsa verde. Uh, it's really good. I'm telling you all these things to do with salsa verde. That's where you can use a lot of your beautiful herbs. And this one over here is um, anise hyssop. Um, and it's really easy to grow. Uh, if you live in a cold climate like I do, um, it's a perennial, so it'll keep coming back year after year. It has really, really beautiful purple flowers on it, and um, I, I, I love the flavor, but I love the anise flavor, um, and that is something that some people are hot and cold on, so for me, I just love that, but it's got a really beautifully intense flavor to it. Okay. So this is my little corner here that I can sit and just eat herbs. And now I'm gonna show you a couple things over here. There is, this is that Oaxacan herb that is really prized down there. It's called pitiona. And I have a bunch of it here because we really like using it. It's one of the, the herbs that can go in yellow mole. If you've been to Oaxaca, uh, you've probably had yellow mole that has hoja santa in it. And this is a different herb. And it's, it's in the mint family because it's got a square stem, but um, it's sort of rugged. It's like, it's a really rugged kind of herb, um, but I really love that. And then this whole monstrosity over here is chaya. So chaya is the most nutritious green 
uh, green known to man and it's native to the Yucatan Peninsula. And uh, we have propagated all of this from like one little piece of it. Um, but the, this is the, the shape of the leaf. Um, some people, this is the variety that doesn't, it's, that is not like stinging nettles. <laughs> so there's a, a wild variety in the Yucatan that is, when you touch it, it will irritate your hands the same way stinging nettles will. But this one um, is not that. This is the sort of uh, more cultivated type. And um, this one, it, it's high in oxalic acid, which is one of the reasons it's kind of good for you. But at the same time, people will tell you to cook it before you eat it. But all through the Riviera Maya, there are a lot of places making smoothies and they're putting raw chaya leaves in there. And I've drunk some of them and I haven't had much of a reaction, but sometimes people will get a scratchiness in their throat and that would be a reaction to oxalic acid. Um, I, I was over here and I didn't say anything about it, but these are all the Johnny Jump Ups here, a type of viola. Um, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them. And we use those a lot as decorations on our, our plates in our restaurants. And then we've got a whole lot of, this is a type of fuchsia. And you'll see those on plates in our restaurant a lot as well. Um, the, you can just stay right there, but I will, I'll grab up. It's the season for the Alpine strawberries here. Uh, we just picked through all of these today, so I don't know if I have one to show you, but you know, the alpine strawberries are these little teeny tiny ones. I'll see if I can find one that's better here. But these are the little tiny, tiny um, uh, alpine strawberries. And they may not look like very much, but man, when you put them in your mouth, they just explode with flavor, like a perfumey flavor. Um, Fres de Bois is the name for them in French. You may have heard that. Alpine strawberries, what we call them here. But we have a big patch of them there. And that give you um, this such a bright burst of things. We don't really do anything with them except use them as garnishes on the tops of plates and that sort of thing. So it's about time for us to be back into the kitchen. So pardon my walking right at you there. But, oh, I didn't say much about... This is all really, this is the hottest place of our garden. Um, and so we have things like rosemary, agaves, a whole bunch of agaves, crown of thorns, which looks really paltry, but it makes me happy. Um, uh, because in Mexico, the crown of thorn plants are huge. A bay tree there. Um, my bay tree of 25 years died last year. And so now I'm starting all over with that. Some more rosemary, a bunch of cactuses here. Um, so we've got lots of different things going on that once they want the most sun and a lot of heat. So I think it's time for us to go back into the kitchen. And I will stop here to talk about tuberous begonias um, because tuberous begonias are a lot of people don't know about them. But these little beautiful blossoms, they taste like pure lemon and tuberous begonias are edible and beautiful and I mean, everybody needs to get to know because as that as a garnish on a plate, it doesn't just look pretty, but it tastes beautiful. It's very lemony. So we will do that. And if we if we all move the right direction for for right here, we could see the little one here. This is Charlie Bell. You want to say hi, Charlie Bell? Yes, there she is. I guess Encanto's over now. I don't know. So we'll come back in here and we will look at that. Um, I'm going to check my timing here, 45 seconds. So I did a pretty good timing on our, our uh, 15 minutes away here. Um, I please ask any other questions here because we're kind of coming down to the, the uh, last little bit here. Um, I think, what is our timing on the 35? 45 seconds too, so all of our timing came out pretty good here. Um, I'm going to take a look at this little cake in here and see if it's ready yet. It needs about three or four minutes, so what we'll do is we'll bring that out after we have finished the, the, the arroz a la tumbada. Okay, so we're ready now. Now that was my 45 seconds being done there. So we will stop that guy. And let's take a look now. Well, I can smell 
the, the beautiful muscle flavor here. So it's done what I would like it to do. Now, this is where you want to... A lot of people would say if a muscle doesn't open at all, then it's probably not going to be the best thing to serve. Um, sometimes we will open them up and taste them. Um, let's just see what, our, what, what we do have to taste right now, which is the rice. So I'm going to go down here and get a little bit of rice. Okay, I can tell you by the way the rice looks that it's done now, that that 15 minutes cooking with the seafood. Mm. And there's another one of our, <laughs> so that was our 35 minutes um, buzzer on that. So I think this is really beautiful. Um, I am ready to just go on to the next step, which will be to take all of these shrimp and to lay them on the top here. And I will just nestle them down. And I think I turned my fire off completely. So we'll turn that back on, but only onto a kind of like a, a medium low again. And nestle these guys in, put the top on, and in two minutes we will come back to that. But that will give us just the right amount of time to go the next step here with this stuff, which will be to chop the cilantro. Let's put the top back on there. That one's not down enough. So they should be nestled in there so that the heat of the broth cooks up, but they'll cook in just a couple of minutes. Um, so now we've got our cilantro here and I, I like a fair amount of cilantro in there. You can make that choice. Uh, or you might be using parsley, as I've given as an alternate in the recipe there. Um, so I'm going to do my signature cut of the cilantro, which is to slice it very thinly across, keeping it bunched up, stems and all, and just keep moving my fingers back inching my fingers back, but cutting up the stems and everything with it. And then that's your chopped cilantro that can be used in lots of things and will keep in your refrigerator for like 24 hours. It'll stay beautiful and green like that. Okay, so I've kind of run out of everything. I'm just stems there. So I'm going to put that away. And you can take that next step if you want to, which is to fluff this. And then the, the big stems, even though I cut it really thin, uh, the stems are heavier than the leaves. And so we will just pick those guys up and put them over there and just keep doing that. And you will see that here at the very bottom, we have mostly stems there, okay. Ah, a beautiful question. Okay, so what I would drink with this um, would be white wine, okay? So I just came back from the, the from Baja. That's why I'm wearing this apron because it was part, well, it was part of two different events. One in the Valle de Guadalupe, uh, two hours south of Tijuana. And um, I was there um, at a winery doing a big celebration dinner with another chef from there. And um, what I would, I, so I'm thinking a lot about these gorgeous wines that I had there. And they like a lot of sort of what I would call steely white wines, but ones that have something really to make them really interesting. So like putting a Viognier together with a Sauvignon Blanc or to, uh, Fiano is another one of the Italian grapes that they grow a fair amount of there. And so that gives it some. So I will say a Sauvignon Blanc blend is the first thing that came to my mind. This is a great dish also 
to uh, have with beer, but I would say that you wouldn't want to go like a super heavy IPA with this. Um, you would want to do something that's more in the Pilsner camp so that it's a little bit lighter and a little bit um, brighter in flavors. I think would, that would be a good thing to do. Okay, so I think we're about ready here. Um, you can also do a light red with this if you're more inclined toward red. And when I say a light red, I would say a light Tempranillo from Spain would be good. Uh, most of the Tempranillos that come from the Valle de Guadalupe in Mexico tend to be a little bit riper and heavier. So I'm thinking mostly here about the, the really the lighter Tempranillos. Um, people would say Pinot Noir, but I wouldn't probably go there. I would probably go with something like Barbera from Italy, which is going to have a, a lightness to it, or a good rich rosé, not like a Tavel rosé from France, not that kind, but one that's got more oomph to it, a Grenache rosé, say, either from France or from, from Spain. So we have a beautiful thing here. Um, I've just turned that off and I'm going to let that sit for a minute. Uh, let's take a look at this good smelling cake here. Nicely browned on the top. Now, I'm going to do something that I don't want you to do, okay? Because I'm going to sort of draw this to a close so that you all can enjoy what you've made. Um, I'm going to just put a knife around the edge of this cake and turn it out, but you should let yours sit. You can run the knife around the edge, but you should let it sit for about 10 minutes before you turn it out. But I'm going to put it into a to a platter and so I can show you what this looks like when you do that. So we'll do that and then if I can reach from one side to the other here, we'll just reverse this like that. I usually do that on my head which probably surprises you but I have more control when I do it that way and we will see what this beautiful thing looks like. You know what? Shall we go back over to the other side? I think it'd probably be better just to finish up because this is where we're going to finish up our, our soup as well, our arroz a la tumbada. Okay, so you can see the little sugar crust on the top with the embedded whole pumpkin seeds there. And I have a little powdered sugar here that I'm going to sprinkle over the whole thing and a little bit on the platter just for effect. And then I'm going to move this out here so that I can make a beautiful bowl of our arroz a la tumbada. Get that guy over there. I'm going to put a whole, a whole handful of cilantro into the arroz and then mix that gently into it. I decided you can do this in a big soup bowl, like a ramen bowl. That's the kind of thing that you would be looking for here. I chose a pozole bowl from Mexico to show this to you in. Um, but if those of you that have eaten the caldo de pollo in a market in Mexico, a lot of times they'll put a big spoon of rice in that and let's see here oh there it is oh that looks really pretty okay here we go arroz a la tumbada you can see the rice i'm going to set that here with uh, some limes because you would always serve that with some limes how about just a little bit of sprinkle of the cilantro over the top and there you have it. We made a rosa la tumbada and a cake in an hour. And hopefully yours is turning out really beautifully. I love being able to share this kind of cooking with you because it's very different than everything else that we released either on television or on our YouTube channel. But um, thank you for joining me with all of, for all of this. I will ask Agatha, do you have any other questions that we need to answer? Thank you all again for joining me and happy cooking, but now happy eating.